There is a road, steep and thorny, beset with perils of every kind, but yet a road, and it leads to the very heart of the universe. I can tell you how to find those who will show you the secret gateway that opens inwardly only and closes fast behind the neophyte forevermore. There is no danger that dauntless courage cannot conquer. There is no trial that spotless purity cannot pass through. There is no difficulty that strong intellect cannot surmount. For those who win onward, there is reward past all telling, the power to bless and to save humanity. For those who fail, there are other lives in which success may come. So wrote H.P. Blavatsky. This little piece was found in her papers after her death, and it has always been called simply, There is a Road. Where is the gateway? Why is it secret? Why does it open onto a steep and thorny road? Well, obviously a road or a path is a metaphor for a life, isn't it? For life. The road of life, the path of life, used frequently as a metaphor for the life we each live. And the steep and thorny road is a metaphor for a specific kind of life. The kind of life that has been talked about really in every great religion. It's called in Christianity the way of the cross, in Judaism the way of holiness, in China the Tao, uh, in Buddhism the Eightfold Path. Uh, it has been suggested to be a reality in many different cultures, and it's always the few who take it because it's very difficult. Most want to go the easy route, the broad way that circles ever so slowly around the mountain. Very few want to go straight to the top. This was talked about in Plato's uh, dialogue, um, uh, the cave, about the cave. You, many of you know the story of everyone was in a cave, chained in a cave. All they saw was the reflections from the light on the wall, and they believed those shadows to be the reality. One person, one man got free and climbed up to the top a very, very difficult journey, the way of the cross, called in Christianity. He climbed up, hurt his knees, scratched himself, uh, got bruised, terribly difficult journey to get up to the top, was blinded by the true light, the sun, and when he recovered and realized where the shadows were coming from, came back down to tell everyone and was duly murdered. Mind set. People will not be confused by fact. <laughs> so when we're talking about a road that opens inwardly only, Surely we're talking about our subjective nature. Uh, it closes fast behind us forevermore. So this inner nature, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, uh, our hopes, aspirations, ideals, all of that's part of our inner nature, our emotions, our mind, all of that, isn't it? Subjective nature. But there's more to that inner nature. It's been called by various names, the soul, the spirit, in some traditions, perhaps. It's been called the inner self in theosophical terminology. The enduring self, that part of us, that aspect of us that goes on. Theoretically, let us be honest here, until we die, we can't be totally sure. But theoretically, and with some evidence for it, it goes on from incarnation to incarnation to incarnation. But what is self? One of our dear friends, English dance friends, a couple, just a few weeks ago, he and his wife were home. She was upstairs in the bedroom talking to a friend on the phone. He was downstairs. 
the friend on the phone, suddenly the phone went dead. Maybe the woman and the, the wife maybe said something or cried out in pain. I don't know what. But she, the friend was so concerned, she called the police. The police knocked on the door. Her husband said, nothing's wrong, everything's fine. They found her dead upstairs. She had a, probably a massive coronary. He has total conviction that no life can exist after death. He believes we are the body, and that's it. And when you're dead, you're dead. There will be no memorials, there will be no funerals, nothing. Too bad for his wife. We meditated for her for several weeks, and for him. Fine people, but the body. Yet if we're the body, why aren't we different people every seven years? Some say, including the adepts, that every cell in the body is different in seven years. Others say some brain cells don't die until we die. But nonetheless, that's a precious few little number of cells compared to the entire body. So why aren't we different? We're not. Still the same. We can think back to when we were five years old. That five-year-old child is dead forevermore. It will never be reborn. That's how I look at reincarnation, by the way. Ed will never reincarnate. Not ever. But all that experience of that child, five-year-old child is now part of us, isn't it? It's part of our character. It's part of what we've learned in life. Not every little thing the child did. Of course, that would be absurd to think that. But the meaningful things that happened when we were five years old, that's part of us, isn't it? So I suggest the possibility, and to me the likelihood, that what we experience throughout this whole incarnation endures. It's carried over and becomes the character which we are in the next incarnation. So... I don't think we could be just the body. What about our emotions? We really identify with those more than we do anything else, pretty, mu pretty much, I think. Somebody hurt me, me. They hurt my feelings, they hurt my emotions. My emotions have suffered a wound. But I can look down on my emotions and realize how they are. What about the mind? That's constantly changing. The emotions are too, constantly changing. We can have a traumatic experience that changes us. We can have a magnificent, enlightening experience that changes us. Who's looking at our mind? I don't think the mind can look at itself any more than the eye can look at itself, except by reflection. So there is an observer, isn't there, that was there ever since your earliest memory as the I, as the self, the observer. Walt Whitman caught on to this in Song of Myself. Both in and out of the game, looking with a side-curved side head, wondering what will come next. Beautiful poem. I did a paper on it in, at New York University. So there is that observer which comes close to the true identity. Most of us have, I suggest to you, lost our identity. We're a little bit like the man who was trying to be rebooked on a flight because all flights between Chicago and New York uh, had been canceled due to storms. I went through that once in reverse and spent a lovely night in O'Hare on cots that made noises you wouldn't believe. <coughs> <laughs> So this was the case with this man, and he, everyone was trying to be rebooked, and he went to the head of the line, properly dressed in a three-piece business suit, and said to the agent uh, on duty, I absolutely have to be on the next flight out. And she said, sir, you're going to have to wait in line like everyone else. And he became incensed and said, do you have any idea who I am? And she took the mic and said, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we have a man here at gate 36 who appears to have lost his identity. <laughs> <clears throat> if anyone can help him find it, please report to gate 36. 
Well, I hope we're not quite as arrogant as that man, <clears throat> but I think maybe there's a possibility we've lost our identity. So if this gate opens inwardly to our self-image, who we think we are, the me, it's not a secret, is it? We know who we think we are, and we put all the labels on us, a teacher, a carpenter, or whatever we happen to be. So it's not really that, because that's no secret, and moreover, it doesn't close fast. We can change it. We can change our self-image. Maybe for the better, maybe not for the better. But we can change it. So there's nothing permanent about our self-image. Changes all the time. The gate that closes behind us is not a gate to self-analysis. That's useful to a limit, to a certain extent. A friend of mine many years ago, a good 40, I probably 50 years ago, was in analysis, and a mutual friend uh, said to him one day, because he was so concerned about examining himself, he said, oh, for God's sake, Lester, put that pen and paper down. <laughs> I mean, it comes, becomes very self-centered, doesn't it? Did I do the right thing? Were my motives right? It's me, 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 me. It's really tiresome. I know some of my friends wish I'd gone through self-analysis more, but I never bothered. Meditation has done it for me. <laughs> and changed me enormously, absolutely enormously. 38 years ago, Mary and I were married, a little more actually, it's December 8, it'll be 39 years, and I don't recognize the man that was before that marriage, and Mary wouldn't have married him. Uh, so I've changed, I feel I've gone through two or three lives since I've lived in New York, and it's the Theosophical Philosophy, and you can put a small T with that, because it doesn't have to be through the organization. Uh, and meditation. I frequently say without meditation and a sense of humor, I would have committed suicide long ago. <laughs> so, uh, it's not a gate to self-analysis, and it's not a gate to new theories and new ideas, even theosophical theories. Some people come into theosophy, and they turn all of the tenets of theosophy into a belief system. And they feel they know. They don't know. We don't know until it's our experience. How is that true? I th mentioned in the book, I can tell you about a place I've been. I was the guest of the United States Army back in the late 50s, and I was sent to Korea, uh, not during the conflict between Korean and Vietnam War, so I was thankful that I didn't have to see combat. And I can tell you about Tong Dushan, which is this village between the DMZ and Seoul. It was pathetically poor. Shacks, roads that were just dirt, and when it rained, it was mud. Railroad tracks going through the town. In kiosks for instead of shops, and the kiosks had open kiosks. They had meat hanging on hooks with flies all over them. They had tubs in the hardware section of nut, nuts and bolts and so forth and so on. So you get an image, don't you, of what it looks like that paints a little picture for you. It's very accurate what I've told you, but had you, if you could go there, and if it looks like I just told you, the minute you got there you'd say, doesn't look like I thought. Because what do we do? We take images out of what we know and create what we don't know. So how much more true is this of the spiritual experiences? If we haven't had them ourselves, we're forming images out of what we already know. Do you see that? Isn't that clear? Now, the theories are useful. I'm not putting them down because they sort of point your mind in a direction where you might go beyond the words because the words never do it. HPB, when she was teaching, she had a group called the Inner Group, and she selected some students that she thought were bright enough and to, to get it. And she had them meet maybe once a week or whatever it was. And one of the students uh, kept notes. And after the class was over, he took it to her and said, did I get it right? And she said, don't be a fool or words to that effect. Nobody can get it right in words, but you've got it close as you can. So it's leaping beyond the words uh, to get it. The gate that permanently closes 
opens to a totally new state of consciousness, the first experience of that inner self. It is qualitatively different from the sense of me, and yet it's not schizophrenic. You know that the me is an outermost expression, and you don't lose sight of it. But that first flash and union with the inner self is unforgettable. It never can be forgotten, though it dims and fades and you come back to brain consciousness and must face even more difficulties than you did before the experience. Blavatsky says, when we really begin to live the spiritual life, truly live it, not through necessarily an organization, uh, but when we begin to live it, when we begin to search, when we begin to seek, why am I here? What is going on? We quicken everything. We bring down more of our karma in one lifetime that would have ordinarily been two or three lifetimes. So don't expect less difficulties. Expect more. Now the good side of it is, the bright side of it is, you get stronger. You can handle it better. So both you're stronger and you're faced with greater challenges. Uh, in the Voice of the Silence, we read, when waxing stronger, thy soul glides forth from her secure retreat and breaking loose from the protecting shrine extends her silver thread and rushes onward. When beholding her image on the waves of space, she whispers, this is I. Declare, O disciple, that thy soul is caught in the webs of delusion." There's always beyond. There's always more. In your meditations, I suggest never think, I've got it. The moment you think it, you've lost it. You don't have it. You've now got duality. The gateway is secret because it's totally unknown until it's experienced. I gave that example of Tang Dushan. Until experienced, it's fabricated. It's theory. It's not the reality itself, is it? St. Thomas Aquinas, I understand, who is the author of much of Roman Catholic theology and wrote the Summa Theologica, an enormous tome, I understand, never having looked at it or read it, and not going to. <laughs> He had a mystical experience, and he said everything he had written was like a heap of straw. And that is the experience of the inner self. I speak from experience, and many thousands can attest to the same. And I believe every human being can do the same. Not easily, only with effort, effortless effort. Now, it's said that when we're born, we get a flash of the life to come. That has been, to some extent, validated by the near-death experiences. It was taught in the ancient wisdom long before the near-death experiences were recorded. But now, the near-death experiences point out that a vast majority, but not everyone, I suppose, gets this flash of the life just lived, don't they? That's the, I, I, I'm, I went ahead of myself. You get a flash of the life just lived when you die. As one of my friends said, by God, Ed, I hope when you die you get a debriefing. <laughs> well, apparently you do. And with some sense of the purpose of the life just lived. Many report that. Not everyone reports it. I think it happens to everyone. I don't know. <clears throat> I know the difference between what I know and what I believe. And what I know is precious little. 
In any case, that's said to happen. It's said that when we're born, and this I cannot prove with any, anything, and I certainly I don't remember any such experience, when we're born, we get a flash of the life to come. And I always say that's why we cry. <laughs> but the thing is, that flash of the life to come is no more the goal than that first flash of the inner self. It's just a preview in a flash. The goal isn't a momentary experience of the inner self, and I can tell you with certainty that when that happens to you, there is no me, there is no time, there is only eternity. And that's not endless time. It is open to all, and few believe it or think it possible, and therefore few make the effort. You get an idea of this in something Blavatsky wrote about meditation. She says, in his hours of silent meditation, the student will find that there is one space of silence within him where he can find refuge from the thoughts, from thoughts and desires, from the turmoil of the senses and the delusions of the mind. By sinking his consciousness deep into his heart, he can reach this place. At first, only when he is alone, in silence and darkness. But when the need for the silence has grown great enough, he will turn to seek it even in the midst of the struggle with self, and he will find it. Only he must not let go of his outer self or his body. He must learn to retire into this citadel when the battle grows fierce, but to do so without losing sight of the battle without allowing himself to fancy that by so doing he has won the victory. That victory is won only when all is silence without, as within, the inner citadel. That's the challenge. A tremendously great challenge. We've not reached the very heart of this universe, Instead, we've reached a steep and thorny road. Why is it steep and thorny? What are the perils? Once realized, that inner self must gain mastery over the mind, the emotions, and the body. Now, if you think that's an easy task, you are deluded. <laughs> that is an incredibly difficult task. It's not the personal ego that gains control. It's that deep reality that gradually impresses its nature on the mind, on the emotions, on the body. Krishnamurti, Jiddu Krishnamurti, who was actually raised by the Theosophical Society, and became a kind of a world teacher, more popular and well-known than the Theosophical Society, was one, he never liked talking about methods. He'd say, if you're in the forest and you see a tiger, you don't ask for a method, you just act. But toward the end of his life, a listener at one of his talks was so frustrated, and he said, sir, isn't there a road from here to there? And Krishnaji said, Yes, there is a road, but it's not from here to there. It's from there to here. In meditation, you may find you get this sense of union with the eternal, and words that describe meditation are every one of them not adequate. Because right away I've created duality by the words. For a moment, there's just the eternal, for a moment, you want to have that affect your mind, your emotions, your body. But inertia is a fact of nature, not only physically, it's a fact emotionally and mentally, isn't it? We go to a party. We get, we're having a great time at the party. We go home and say, I can't go to sleep right away. I'm too revved up. 
Your emotions are going. They have to slow down before you can go to sleep. Same with your mind. People who have trouble sleeping, very often, they start thinking about things when they go to bed. Deadly mistake. You can be up all night doing that. I turn my mind off when I go to bed. Maybe that's not so easy to do, but it's relatively easy to do. Uh, especially if you meditate, because you sort of know how to empty your mind of thought once you learn that, and then you go to sleep. So, <clears throat> we need to overcome all kinds of challenges and difficulties. There's the steep and thorny road. Everyone on the spiritual path, it is said in the Mahatma letters, letters written to A.P. Sinnott uh, back in the 1880s, uh, and which are historical documents in the British Library, so we know these men existed. We have their letters. Uh, they talk about having to destroy a, the living wall of our personal ego, the me. We're identifying with the mental, emotional patterns of our nature, and we call it me. Only when we have this deeper realization do we discover that that is a pattern which has been created and which can be destroyed, and the true self remains. We must lose our life to find our life, said the Christian teacher. Well, Jesus, are you saying we should go commit suicide? I don't think so. But we must lose that sense of the me to find the real self. Uh, and that comes not immediately. It's a gigantic task. Here's a statement from the Mahatma letters. The process of self-purification is not the work of a moment, nor of a few months, but of years, nay, extending over a series of lives. The later a man begins living the higher life, the longer must be his period of probation, for he has to undo the effects of long number of years spent in objects diametrically opposed to the real goal. There's the inertia, you see the way we've lived, the way we think, the way we act, the way we feel. We repeat this over and over. I don't think most of us, and I include myself, I'm never talking down to anyone. Whatever I say, I've said to myself and I still say to myself. Because I believe the human race is a theme and variation. We're all the same. It's just a, you ever hear Mozart's twinkle, twinkle, little star? In variation, it starts off bum bum ba da dee da dee dum ba dee da 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 dee. Well, by the end of it, you wouldn't know that's what it was, but if you listen carefully, it is. It's always that, and there's the human race for you. We all look and feel different and act differently and seem different, but the twinkle twinkle little star is what we really are. <laughs> it's going on all the time. Our hopes, our fears are very similar. So let's say we think maybe there's something to this path, this evolutionary process, this spiritual awakening. Let's say that we think that's maybe possible. Theoretically, we say that sounds reasonable. I'd like to find out if it's true. I really want to know if it's true. Where do I begin? Blavatsky wrote this, the first necessity for obtaining self-knowledge is to become profoundly conscious of ignorance. Many of us know it all and we're willing to share. <laughs> to feel with every fiber of the heart that one is ceaselessly self-deceived. The second requisite is the still deeper conviction that such knowledge, such intuitive and certain knowledge, can be obtained by effort. The third and most important is an indomitable determination to obtain and face that knowledge. 
Self-knowledge of this kind is unattainable by what men usually call self-analysis. It is not reached by reasoning or by any brain process, for it is the awakening to consciousness of the divine nature of man. H. P. Blavatsky once described meditation as the inexpressible longing of the inner self for the infinite. I fully agree with that. I've had it since I was four years old. I had a lot of difficulty with my father. I thought he hated me until I was in high school. It did horrible damage. But I instinctively knew it was wrong to hate, and I never hated him. And I'm grateful for that. So I've always longed. The vertical exit was the only one for me. I thought of it as God as a child. I think of it very differently now. I was so devoutly religious when I was a child going to a Protestant church that feared to put a cross on the table for fear it looked Catholic. When I first saw Catholic ritual, I was home but wouldn't join the Roman Church. So I thought it was God, an external God. I no longer think that. But the, ex but the presence, the spiritual presence, is far more powerful than it ever was when I had a more crystallized belief. So that inexpressible longing has, is the drive. If we don't have that, we're not going to go anywhere, are we? This is the use of ordinary desire, even. If we didn't desire anything, we wouldn't do anything. So desire itself isn't wrong. It's the attachment to the, ac the, uh, uh, attachment to the objects of desire and the identification with the desire, thinking the desire is me. That's where we get into trouble. But we have to be motivated to do something, don't we? And if we have this spiritual quest, it's an incredible longing for union with the eternal. And you can call it by any name you want. I don't use the word God because it has a lot of baggage connected to it. It means something different to everybody, really. I remember when I was in Spain with Mary many, many years ago, and we were visiting a baths that had been set up, Roman baths, I guess. And it was a private home at the time, so the woman who owned the place let us in, and we paid the fee, whatever it was. And of course, she didn't speak English, and so I was translating for Mary, and at one point she said something about the church, and, and something about uh, birth control or something came up, and I said, well, of course, the church prohibits it. And she said, I only one speaks Spanish, so I'll do it in English. She said, ah, she said, oh, the church has its ideas, and we have ours. <laughs> and so for every Roman Catholic there's a different God in a way for every Protestant there is to, to some extent <laughs> so what must we do to reach this uh, secret gateway and pass through it there's a book, a little book theosophical classic called At the Feet of the Master it's just a tiny little booklet really rather than a book uh, Krishnamurti was guided to write it when he was 13, I believe, by Mrs. Besson. In his later life, he didn't want his name on it, so we removed his name and just put Alcyone, which was one of the lives Leadbeater, Bishop Leadbeater, claimed was one of Krishnamurti's past lives. I take all that sort of thing with a grain or a dose of salts, because how can you know? for sure. Uh, was Leadbeater deluded? I don't know. Was he right? I don't know. I leave those things totally open. I neither believe nor disbelieve. But in any case, it's a lovely little book, and it's been helpful to many, many people. And there are some qualities that are said to be essential for this spiritual path. The first is called in the book discrimination, but it really is better said to be discernment because discrimination tends to mean, you know, prejudice against one group or another. So discernment, we must see accurately what is. We must be like the little boy who sees that the emperor is naked when everybody else sees clothes on him, you see. Uh, 
The second one is desirelessness. No personal motive, ego-free. Personal desires must not prevent us from doing what is right. In one of the Upanishads, there's a line, the, the, the sweet is one thing, the right is another. And all of us have at one time done the right as opposed to the sweet. The example I often give is in a family. You're having a delicious sleep at 3 a.m. in the morning, and a child in the family screams out, screams out in pain. What do you do? Do you say, shut up, I'll tend to you in the morning? No. You get up. The sweet is to go back to sleep. The right is to get up and tend to what's wrong. So the sweet is one thing, the right is another, and I am afraid to say, I am sorry to say, not afraid, I'm sorry to say, that a large number of people choose the sweet over the right. Mrs. Besant had a choice like that once. She was friends and colleagues with Mohandas Gandhi, and she helped him free India from colonial rule and was actually the first president of the uh, Congress party, which still exists today. Uh, and yet in the film on Gandhi, they never mentioned her. I thought that was outrageous because not only was she the first president of the Congress party, she was a woman and she was a British citizen of Irish extraction. Uh, and they ignored her uh, in that film. No, no. Whatever the reasons, the director didn't put her in. So, so. Anyway, uh, desire, what she did was, she, Gandhi wanted the British out to the last red coat. And she said, if you do that, you're going to get a bloodbath. Well, she turned out to be right, I think, if I'm not mistaken. But she parted with him on that and said that while she thought there should be home rule, she didn't think the British should leave immediately like that. And um, she knew when she did it, she would lose the adulation of the Indian crowds. And she was right. But she thought that was the right thing to do. And she did it. Whether she was right or wrong, I don't know. But that's what she thought was right. And she was courageous enough to do it, knowing that she wouldn't have the admiration of the Indian population like she did before she broke. But they still think highly of her. And while many of them in Chennai don't know anything about the Theosophical Society, they know about Mrs. Besson, and they'll call the society Annie Besson's Society. <laughs> and in Chennai, near the, at the sea, at the Bay of Bengal, there's a little park, a lovely little park, maybe about the size of this room, maybe a little larger. It isn't a park like, you know, Central Park or something. <clears throat> but it's a park-like area, and there's a beautiful statue of Mrs. Besson there. Uh, and they name streets after her. There's the Besson, Besson Avenue and Besson chemist shop and things like that. Uh, so they have great admiration for Mrs. Besson. All right, it's discrimination or discernment, desirelessness, good conduct, an ethical life at the very least. Love, which is central certainly to Christianity, though absent in many Christians, uh, it's still the teaching. And if we can be sure about anything that Jesus taught, it was to love your neighbor as yourself, wasn't it? That was his, seemed to be his primary teaching. Um, Mrs. Besant once defined love in a way that I think is the best. I've never heard it defined better. She said, love is the response that comes from a realization of oneness. And if you think back on any time you suddenly felt affection toward another human being or an animal, didn't you at the moment of that, just before that rush of affection, there wasn't a me, was there? Wasn't there a sense of union with that creature, with that person? And the minute you sense that unity, it's a rush of feeling. And I suggest to you the possibility that compassion, which is more than personal love, that compassion might be a sudden realization of the unity with all. And then there's that tremendous rush that we call compassion. Now, there's another statement that I've given you on the handout. You don't need to look at it. You'll take it with you when you go, uh, which is instructions for the kind of life that's necessary. In the early part of the Secret Doctrine, there's actually a statement, <clears throat> live the life necessary, and wisdom will come to you naturally. 
So it requires a way of life. Why is that? Think for a minute. If our emotions and our mind are in constant flux, in constant turmoil, thoughts running through the mind unbidden, the mind and the emotions then, which are very much connected, it's like a wavy, it's like a bunch of waves on a mountain lake, isn't it? Like that? Does it reflect what's above it accurately? Not at all. Not at all. Only when the mind and the emotions are very calm does it reflect clearly what's above it. I have, used to have, long since gone, when I was with the army, got to Japan a few times, Tokyo and Kyoto. In Kyoto, there's a temple called the Golden Temple. Well, that's its popular name. I don't remember its true name. And, you know, they, they have a lake in front of it, and they deliberately put uh, silt, I think, down so that it reflects what's above it. I took a photo. You can't tell which is the true temple and which is the one in the, in the lake. It's just so accurately reflected. It's just gorgeous. So when the mind is like that, it, actually re ac it accurately reflects the inner nature, you see. And what does it, what is it that makes our mind a mess and our emotions a mess? desire and attachment to the objects of desire. And that's not just physical things. It's not just lust. It's not just sex. It's not just money. Desire, craving, can't live without feeling. We can live without everything, including the physical body. But we don't believe it because we're identified with it, you see. So, a way of life which is altruistic is really the keynote. The true theosophist, whether they've ever heard of the Theosophical Society or not, is the one who lives an altruistic life. In the Voice of the Silence, again, the first to live to benefit mankind is the first step, not the last step. Does that mean you have to do great things? No. It means you just have to be conscious of the fact you're not the only person on earth. I walk on the sidewalks, I must admit it irritates me, and that's a challenge I have to overcome. Four people walking abreast as though they're on a country lane. You've all come upon it. In the supermarket, with narrow aisles in New York, big aisles everywhere else, <coughs> carts diagonally perched across the aisle and somebody staring at the shelves. I say unconscious. They're unconscious. They're not, they don't mean harm. They don't mean to be in your way. They're just unaware, unconscious of what they're doing. Chris, uh, C.W. Leadbeater, who was a bishop of the liberal Catholic Church, he once uh, wrote to one of the adepts, K.H., Kutumi was his pen name, at least, if not his real name. Wanted to know if he could be a student of the adept and if he had to go to India to be a student. And the adept wrote back, you do not have to go to India because anyone suited for this work stands out like a candle in a dark valley. Now, let's face it, you and I aren't much. We aren't doing fantastic things for humanity. But look around. Some people would steal the eyes off your... I was going to say... I mixed a metaphor. I was going to say steal the pennies off a dead man's eyes. Theft. Unconscionable con artists that we get phone calls from all the time, and you do too. Afterward, I'll tell you interesting and amusing ways to deal with that. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> No conscience. Steal the life savings from an old person. No wonder we stand out like a candle in a dark valley. It's only a candle. That's the other part of it. We're only a candle. We're not a big beam. But the valley is so dark that it's obvious who might be suited to this work. And this work is altruistic. Here's the Golden Stairs, which is slightly edited, but most of it. 
This is the life that's had to be lived, lived according to the adept who gave this to Blavatsky. A clean life, an open mind. And an open mind, by the way, is not just I'm willing to listen to different ideas. It's I'm willing to give up my own most precious idea and belief in the face of evidence that contradicts it. This is something that political partisans on all sides, we're not going to talk about politics, can't do. They'll keep their point of view no matter how many facts are presented to them that's not... Hmm? The open mind is the willingness to give up our own most precious belief in the face of evidence that contradicts it, that proves it wrong. So it's, again, it's not being, it's not fitting into the category of those who won't be confused by fact. <laughs> there have been some studies on that, very interesting studies about um, actual ideas that different political parties have, uh, partisans have had and how when presented with the evidence, they actually dug their heels in more for their opinion rather than the facts. Um, just as an aside, if you're interested in getting facts, there's a wonderful website called factcheck.org. It's wonderful. The liberals think it's conservative. The conservatives think it's liberal. <laughs> they get after them all. Obama said this, but here's the fact. Romney said this. Here's the facts. <laughs> it's, it's a sister site called Fact Check, going after ads. Yeah, that's a good one. See, this is how you make your opponent look like, a, yeah. like somebody evil. Take a few words he said, cut out all the context. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. But don't you think, whatever people's political philosophy is, that's another matter. People can choose that. Since, you know, I respect that. It's when they don't pay attention to the facts. That's what upsets me. You know, just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> when I say that on Dragnet, you know. <laughs> okay, a clean life and open mind. You're entitled to your own opinion, not your own facts. That's right. That's a very good way of putting it. Very good way of putting it. A clean life and open mind, a pure heart, perhaps meaning without personal motive, an eager intellect. Not just willing to accept, to listen to other ideas, but seeking, trying to discover what truth is. Using your mind. An unveiled spiritual perception. A brotherliness for one's co-disciple. A readiness to give and receive advice and instruction. There's always somebody who knows more than we do. There's always somebody who knows less. There's always somebody we can help. There's always somebody who can help us. A courageous endurance of personal injustice. That's tough. And Blavatsky had a very hard time with it. A brave declaration of principles. Those two go together. Endurance of personal injustice, but a brave declaration of principles. And Socrates in Plato's writings was a great example of this in the ancient world. He would not give up his principles, but he endured death rather than give up his principles. He could have escaped, according to the literature. They had bribed the jailer. All you have to do is walk out. And he said, I won't do it. I won't teach people to disobey the law. Who is remembered now, his accusers or Socrates? The great one was the one who had a brave declaration of principles. Oh. And uh, because of that. Yeah. Anybody Which museum? Uh, Metropolitan. Metropolitan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a courageous endurance of personal injustice, a brave declaration of principles. And it doesn't mean you lie down like a rug and let people walk on you. It doesn't mean that at all. You do what you can to stand for what's right. You don't keep quiet about it. But if there's nothing you can do about persecution, then there's nothing you can do. You do everything you can but you have to accept what is. A valiant defense of those who are unjustly attacked and a constant eye to the ideal of human progression and perfection which the sacred science depicts. 
These are the golden stairs, up the steps of which the learner may climb to the temple of divine wisdom, that being your own inner self, the true teacher. So as much as we'd like to have an easy step-by-step guide, and there are people who will sell them to you at great cost, (laughs) there really isn't a single method for everyone. The goal, says the voice of the silence, is the same for all. The root is unique to the individual. Why? Because the root is your life, that's why. Each life is unique. Each life is like a wave in the great sea. The wave is part of the sea. There's only one sea. Many waves, but every one of those waves is part of the sea. You can't cup a wave out of the sea and say, here's the wave and there's the sea. Each wave is an aspect of the sea. Each wave is unique. It has its own characteristics. A small wave gently lapping against the sea, the, the, the shore that a baby can be put in to, to enjoy. A tsunami that can destroy whole towns. Each wave has its time in, and crashes to the floor, to the to the shore, and goes back to what it always was. You and I are waves in an eternal sea. So we just have pointers and guideposts. In all the great religious traditions, there are pointers. There are guideposts. And in all of the great religions, there's corruption and superstition and nonsense. Without exception. It happens even in modern psychology. Carl Jung wrote once, when I read the Jungians, I'm glad I'm Carl Jung. I have heard myself quoted at the New York Theosophical Society by our friend Bart Ladovsky from thinking of him. As Ed says, and I say, what, what, what? Ed didn't even think that, let alone say it. So we miss here. I went to a lecture once many years ago before I, uh, when I was just early in New York. It wasn't on theosophy, and I can't remember what it was. And the speaker Before he started, he said, there's going to be 101 lectures here tonight. The one I am giving and the 100 you are hearing. (laughs) How much more is it obvious from that even that spiritual things must be experienced? We must get that aha flash of understanding within us that wipes out the theories, that wipes out the words. Meister Eckhart, a medieval Christian mystic, once said to the brothers, how dare you speak of God when you know him not? Well, there's a lot of talk about the old man, isn't there? Sometimes it makes me nauseous. I'm a curmudgeon of the true type of (laughs) curmudgeon. Carmudgeons are not without feeling. They have powerful feelings, but they will not allow anyone to say something is love when it's sentimental slop. And they'll smack it down. I sometimes feel like saying, don't dare tell me that mud puddle is the Pacific Ocean. I've seen the Pacific Ocean. I wouldn't do it for someone who was trying to go along the spiritual path. But it's so different from the experience. One more, and that is a simple guidepost called the three limbs of the theosophical life. Study, meditation, service. I used to think they were three noble things that stood independently. I've come in later years to realize they are one whole. Study, when we study, we're not thinking of me, are we? We're absorbed and the me vanishes. Oh, it's still there. It, we, did, we didn't get rid of the personal ego, but it's, it's diminished. It's sort of put on the sidelines for a while. And you're totally absorbed in what you're studying. That's a kind of meditation, especially when it's spiritual matters. You read something in the voice of the silence or even the Bible, whatever, that just you feel there's something to it that you haven't quite understood. You're pushing to understand. 
Meditation is an inward study. It goes beyond the personal ego also. If it's, if it's locked in the personal ego, I don't know what it is, but it's not meditation. It, 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 it may be helpful. I mean, maybe it makes you feel quieter. I don't know what it does. But it has to go, to me anyway, my view and my experience of many years meditating, <clears throat> it has to go beyond the me. The me has to be dropped so that it's an internal study meditation. It's a seeking, it's a longing, it's a searching for the root of your own being. Where did I come from? And again, the words don't work because you have I in it and it's not, doesn't work that way. This search, this longing, in a way it's been epitomized by a nursery rhyme. I often use it as an example. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to see the queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you there? I frightened a mouse under the chair. Most people frighten mice under chairs. I always wanted to see the queen. So if you have that longing, you see, it pushes you on. And without it, it's the sine qua non. Without that, nothing. That's, that's the drive, the drive. So study, meditation. Study is meditation, meditation is study. And the two combined bring you to closer realization of unity. Looking into the eyes of another human being, even if you don't like them, if you really look, you see that same consciousness in them that's in you. You see it in an animal, and then how can you kill an I'm going to now betray my own personal preferences. How can you kill that animal and eat its flesh and blood? That doesn't mean people who are not vegetarians are not spiritual. The Dalai Lama is not a vegetarian. Blavatsky was not a vegetarian. Hitler was a vegetarian. I don't think always, but for a while he was. Probably for extraordinarily selfish reasons. So, service... It, the result of meditation and study is a sense of unity which brings compassion, which brings service. And service is an attitude of mind. It's not, as I said earlier, doing great things, although that's fantastic if you can. It's just being aware on the street. Today, coming down the street, there was a, 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 plastic, a, a metal lid. Well, I should have picked it up. I didn't do that, but I pushed it aside so that people wouldn't step on it. I mean, it's just automatic, isn't it? You see someone fall on the street. I remember once I fell on the subway platform, wrenched my back, something horrible. In a, in a flash, there were five or six people standing around me, helping me to get up, making sure I didn't need an ambulance. That's service. It's instinctive. It's an attitude of mind being aware that I'm not the only one in this supermarket. I'm not the only one on this street. There are others who need to get by me. If I'm slow, which sometimes in my 76 years I am, other times I still walk as fast as I used to, and when I have to walk slowly, I get far on the right, and I figure now everybody's got a chance to go by me. Well, that, I'm not doing anything great, am I? It's just common sense if you think about it. But it's so lacking, it's the dark valley again. You know? So service is an attitude of mind. I used to have a karma of putting up chairs. I didn't help this time put up chairs. <laughs> but in Scottish dancing, our demonstration team, I used to be on a demonstration team of Scottish country dancing. It was really a good team in those days, really. The men were excellent, the women were excellent. All with the footwork, the whole bit. And. Uh, I don't know. It seemed to be my karma to come into an empty room and have to put chairs up and put them away. It was there. It was at the Theosophical Society. Everywhere I went, I was picking chairs up and putting them back. <laughs> now I tend to let the younger ones do it a little more <laughs> and reap my reward. <laughs> so who can lead us to this secret gateway? <clears throat> Ultimately, of course, it's our own innermost self. But there is help along the way. The innermost nature 
that <coughs> shines through every human being, but it shines very feebly through most of us. That is because our egos, our personal ego, the me, is like a cloud. Those egos are like clouds. Some are dark and threatening. Some are pleasant and fluffy. But to some extent, each cloud, even the fluffy light ones, block the sunlight of the true self. In some human beings, such as the adepts, the holy ones, the rishis, the saints, the sages of humanity, in them it shines brilliantly through a cloudless sky and illuminates and uplifts the whole world. So while it is true that it is our innermost self that can show us the secret gateway, <clears throat> it is also true that the light shining through the adepts can influence us, guide us, inspire us to the good. That influence is not personal. If we deeply long to alleviate the suffering, to alleviate suffering in all its forms, if we are motivated by compassion and altruism, we are, they say in their letters, automatically within the sphere of their influence. That's what puts us in the sphere of their influence, the life lived, not the ideas we have, not belief in them or not belief in them. Moreover, if we can and do, we, moreover, we can and we do contribute to that stream of influence. And in so doing, we can become co-workers with our older brothers. If we want to find the secret gateway and follow the road to the reward past all telling, we can. But we must be driven by compassion for all who suffer. Animals, and the environment, our human brothers and sisters. We must have an iron, never-failing determination and yet be meek and gentle, having shut out from our hearts every passion that leads to evil. We must be clad with the armor of courage, take up the shield of purity, and wield the sword of intellect. If we do that, we will enter the sphere of influence that streams forth from the tireless efforts of the adepts. Then we can work with them impersonally for the good of humanity as a whole. Then we can know who we really are. Then we can be free. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I have a website, um, it's just edwardabdel.com, and um, the book is available at, usually, though sometimes they run out, at Quest Bookshop, so if you're going to get it there in New York, call them first. Quest Bookshop on 53rd Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, right next to the Society's Lecture Hall, this, it's own, the bookshop is owned by the New York Theosophical Society. You can get it through Amazon.com, um, no doubt at a lower price. List price is $15.95 uh, plus tax. <clears throat> and, um, and maybe other retail. Uh, I know when it first came out, you could get it on the shelf at Barnes & Noble. Up, uh, not Barnes & Noble. Was it Barnes & Noble? Yeah, Barnes & Noble on Fifth Avenue. But I don't think it's there anymore because it's been out for too long. You know. The Secret Gateway. And it's just Edward Abdul. You can check. Uh, Amazon gave it five stars, by the way. Okay. okay. And as I said, the royalties go to the society, so it's helping the society a little bit. And it will be in an e-book eventually. I had to sign a release.